Welcome back to our learning course. In the last few lessons, we looked at some findings showing that animal learning is more sophisticated than one might have anticipated. I am referring to the lessons Animals as Naive Detectives, Contiguity and Contingency, and Overshadowing. This lesson continues the same thread. We will look at learning experiments that initially puzzled scientists because they seem to contradict the fundamental idea that learning is determined by rewards and punishments. Of course, rewards and punishments are important, but based on the data that we will review in this lesson, we now understand that they are not everything. This lesson will introduce some mystery. We will not be able to explain everything that we see. To resolve the mystery, we will have to wait until the lessons on the Roscoe and Wagner model. This is a theory of learning that can explore most of the facts in this and previous lessons. Before looking at the data, we need to say a bit more about fear conditioning because some of the experiments we will talk about use this technique. You can review the lesson on Pavlovian preparations if you don't remember about fear condition. In a nutshell, fear is measured by training the animal to perform a behavior that is easily measured, like lever pressing in this video. We then measure fear by measuring how much a potentially fearful stimulus disrupts the behavior. In this video, a sound CS had been paired with a foot shock, and we can see that the rat stops pressing the lever while the sound plays. But how exactly do we measure this? We want a nice number that we can make graphs of. The traditional measure is called suppression ratio, and it looks like this. It may look scary, but it's not that complicated. It involves two measures. The first is how much the animal performs the behavior when the CS is not on. This is indicated as B pre-CS in the formula because it is usually measured right before the CS comes on. For example, the rat might press the lever 20 times per minute when the CS is not on. The second measure is how much of the behavior is performed when the CS is on. This is the BCS term. For example, if the animal is very afraid, this measure will be low, like two or three lever presses per minute, or even zero. These two numbers are combined in such a way that zero indicates complete suppression of behavior, corresponding to BCS equals zero, and 0.5 indicates no suppression at all, that is, BCS equal B pre-CS. We can see this in the formula. If we have no fear of the CS, BCS will be equal to B pre-CS, which will give us a value of 0.5 in the formula. If we have a strong fear, instead, BCS is zero, and so the whole S will be zero. This measure works, but is notoriously confusing. First, it is backward, with a lower number indicating more fear. Second, it is not clear why no fear should be indicated by an arbitrary number like 0.5. So if we graph the suppression ratio during an experiment, we see that as the animal learns to be afraid, the suppression ratio goes down. We would like a measure that shows that our index of learning goes up as the animal learns. I like to use an alternative measure that I call the suppression percentage. It works as follows. It still uses the same two measures, the rate of the behavior before and during the CS, but these are combined a bit differently. The result is that now 0% means no fear, and 100% means a fear so strong that stops all ongoing behavior. Again, we can see this in the formula. If we have no fear, the two numbers will be the same, which means that the subtraction at the numerator of the fraction is zero, and so the suppression percentage will also be zero. On the other hand, if there is a strong fear, the behavior in the presence of the CS will be zero, which means that these two terms are zero, and then you have something over itself, and this will give you 100 because of the 100 multiplication in front. These are the same data as before, but now plotted with a suppression percentage rather than with suppression ratio. We can see that now our measure of learning is indeed increasing as the animal gets more afraid of the CS. I find this easier to understand, and I will use this measure whenever we talk about a fear conditioning experiment. I also wanted to introduce you to the traditional measure because you might encounter it in papers and textbooks. All right, we are finally ready to talk about the blocking experiment. Here is the design of the original experiment performed by Leon Kamin in the 1960s. 
with two groups of rats as experimental subjects. We called the first group control and the second blocking. The original design included a couple more groups, but this is not important right now. It is easier to understand the design if you look at phase two first. In this phase, a light and a sound were presented together and then followed by a shock. This phase was identical for both groups. The difference was in phase one. For the control group, nothing happened in phase one. The blocking group, however, received presentations of the sound alone followed by the shock. The final test presented the light and evaluated how much it suppressed lever pressing. The results showed a great difference between the two groups. In control animals, the light suppressed lever pressing almost completely. We can see a suppression percentage of 90%. In the blocking group, on the other hand, there was almost no suppression, only 10%. This means that only control rats became afraid of the light. Why is this a surprising result? Note that the light has been followed by the shock exactly the same number of times in both the control and the blocking group. If reinforcement with the shock were everything that matters, the two groups would have become equally afraid of the light. Of course, one difference between the two groups is that animals in the blocking group were already afraid of the sound at the time that the light was introduced. In fact, the experiment is called blocking because we say that the previous experience with the sound have blocked the learning about the light. But why does being afraid of the sound block learning about the light? We will see a preliminary explanation at the end of this lesson and a more detailed one in a future lesson. We will see a preliminary explanation at the end of this lesson and a more detailed one in a future lesson once we have covered the Rescon and Wagner model of learning. For the time being, the message is that blocking shows that reinforcement is not the only thing that matters for learning about a stimulus. In fact, things are even more interesting. Kamin also demonstrated an effect that we now call unblocking. There were three groups of rats in this experiment. The first two groups replicated the blocking experiment exactly. And we see that the results were identical, 90% secretion in the control group and 10% in the blocking group. The third group was similar to the blocking group, but the shock in phase two was larger, as indicated here by the double bolt symbol. We call this the unblocking group, and the reason is that rats in this group did become afraid of the light, even if they were already afraid of the sound. We can see a suppression ratio of 72%, almost as high as in the control group. So, being already afraid of the sound blocked learning about the light if the same shock was used in phase one and two, but not if phase two employed a larger shock. Like with blocking, we will see a preliminary explanation of this result at the end of this lesson and a detailed explanation in a future lesson. The last experiment we want to discuss in this lesson shows a phenomenon called overexpectation. It shows another counterintuitive property of reinforcement, that reinforcing stimuli can actually decrease responding to them. We look at an experiment by Lattal and Nakajima. In phase one, rats experience three stimuli. We have a light stimulus, a sound stimulus indicated by the bell, and a noise stimulus indicated by the speaker symbol. This was a Pavlovian conditioning experiment. At the end of each stimulus, the rats were given access to food, but they did not have to do anything specific to get that food. The conditioned response measure was magazine entry. That is how often the rats stack their heads in the food magazine while waiting for the food. You can look this procedure up in the lesson on Pavlovian preparations if you are not familiar with it. In phase two, the light and noise were presented together, which was followed by exactly the same food as in phase one. The last phase tested responding to the light and to the bell. The difference between these two stimuli is that only the light was present in phase two while the bell had been trained only in phase one. The results show that responding to the light and bell was the same at the end of phase one, so the training was equally effective in the beginning. But after phase two, responding to the light had decreased a lot. This is puzzling because it means that rewarding the light with food during phase two led the rats to care less about the light. I promise there are some explanation of the results we have seen even if we'll have to wait a few lessons for the full story.
what we can do now is to adopt the point of view of the naive detective that we have been considering in the last few lessons. The idea is to try to imagine what you would do if you were trying to figure out what is happening next. You have to imagine that you are the animal without any particular knowledge of experimental psychology of what the uh, researcher wants to test. This perspective gives the following suggestions for what might be going on in blocking, unblocking, and overexpectation. If you look back at the experimental designs in the previous slides, you can see that the following interpretation make at least some sense. In blocking, animals in the blocking group already know that the shock is coming. Because of the previous experience with the sound, they were able to predict the shock based on the presence of the sound. Maybe this is why they didn't learn about the light. There's nothing new to figure out. It's like the animal were saying or thinking, I don't need to learn anything now because I already know that the shock is coming. In unblocking, however, there is something new because the shock used in phase two is larger than the one in phase one. So maybe the animals are learning about the light because they are looking for how to predict the larger shock. It's like they were thinking, the shock is stronger than I expected. There must be something going on to learn about. Lastly, in overexpectation, the rats first learn that all three stimuli signal an equal amount of food. When we put two of the stimuli together, maybe they are thinking that more food will come, some because of the first stimulus and some more because of the second stimulus, and then they are disappointed, so to speak, when they get the same amount. And maybe when they are disappointed, they think the stimuli are worth less. This might be why we see the rats expecting little food after the light in the final test. It's like they were thinking, there are two stimuli now, but I'm not getting more food. So the two stimuli are not as good as I thought. And one of these two stimuli is the light that is later tested. These explanations are interesting, but how can we know if they are correct? As I mentioned earlier, in future lessons, we will look at a nice theory of learning called the Roscoe and Wagner model that can explain most of the things we are seeing. To conclude, I should add that blocking, unblocking, and overexpectation have been studied most often in Pavlovian conditioning, but they also happen in instrumental conditioning. For example, Lattal and Nakajima found a similar overexpectation effect in an instrumental conditioning version of their experiment, where the stimulus signaled the opportunity to obtain food by pressing a lever. Let's mentally add this to the list of things that Pavlovian and instrumental conditioning have in common. This will help us later to make sense of both. This lesson is over. Happy learning to everyone.